In this video, a posterior thoracic uh, fusion for scoliosis is demonstrated using a side loading set. Idiopathic scoliotic patients typically present with imbalance and right sided curve, demonstrated here with the prominence of the chest. The x rays, the middle one showing the standing view with the curved spine, with the rel relative flexibility of the lumbar spine, allowing a thoracic only approach. Preoperatively, the patients need to be counseled to the natural history, the likelihood of curve progression, the distortion of the chest, the cardiac and pulmonary consequences. And the risks of the surgery need to be discussed, including the 0.3% of paralysis, 1% of infection, failure of instrumentation, failure of union, persistent loss of skin sensation around the scar, altered sensation, and the appearance, and the appearance of the scar. The surgery itself must also be discussed with the four hours in theatre, one to two nights in the high care unit, three days in three to four days in the ward. The patient will be rapidly mobilised around day two. How pain management will be performed, uh, but also limited to allow the patient to mobilise and not simply be uh, asleep most of the time. Scar management and the fact that the child is likely to be off school for four to six weeks, depending on the school environment. The, surgery, uh, the surgical risks are minimized with the use of technology to monitor the spinal cord functions throughout the procedure. The sophisticated anesthetics are utilized with multi uh, different drugs utilized to maintain the patient's sleep, but the spinal cord and brain alive and well for monitoring. The spine is then exposed subperiosteally. The level is confirmed to ensure that we start at the correct level of the spine. Then pedicle screws are placed by cannulating a path down the pedicle of the spine into the visual body. This is probed to ensure a circumferential bony wall. In other words, that the spinal canal has not been violated, placing the neurological elements at risk. Once the surgeon is happy that this cannulation has occurred, again probing here, once it has been made a little deeper, the depth will be used to identify the length of screw, typically a 40 or 45 millimeter by 6 millimeter. The screw is then placed in the same angle as was the, as the cannulated pedicle path. The flexibility of the curve can be ascertained both by pulling on the screws but manual palpation on the problems to see the correctability. The facets need to be exposed to planned thoracic screws. Here, um, the facet joint is created out. If the superior articular process of the vertebrae is not visible, uh, it, the inferior aspect of the lamina above and joint above can be resected using a Kapner gouge or other technology. The, the facet needs to be visualized as it, is, as it allows placement of the entry point of the pedicle screw using a lateral one-third medial two-thirds. Here the capnic gouge is being used to remove a piece of the inferior aspect of the bone. This will be done later anyway uh, for the fusion process but in this case due to it being in the concavity the supraarticular process is not well recognized and needs more further um, exposure. The white glistening cartilage is scratched off for the fusion process and then the um, pedicle start will be used using the one-third lateral, two-thirds medial entry point. And then a pedicle all will be used to cannulate the pedicle, taking into account the anatomy of that level of the thoracic vertebra as well as the rotation. Uh, this needs to be angled carefully, not to violate the canal and not to violate laterally. Again, there's a lot of feel by the surgeon. There is some technology that can be used if required, but most com um, surgeons are quite competent to do that once experienced. It is then probed to assess bony feedback that the uh, pedicle walls are intact. In other words, that the canal has not been violated, probed again, and screws placed. This will be done repeatedly at multiple levels until all the screws are placed usually at every second level in the relatively mobile curve. Then the rod length needs to be determined, which can be quite tricky because there will be a lengthening during the correction process. It needs to be contoured 
to provide a physiological sagittal um, balance while the coronal deformity is corrected. This will then be placed adjacent to the screw heads and the screws uh, sequentially connected to the rod. This can either be done by placing the rod in the final coronal position and the rotatory position and the spine reduced to the rod. Um, at other times it may be more, be more uh, may be easier to place a rod lying closer to the screw heads uh, and reduce the screw and the spine to the rod and then finally rotate the rod to bring the spine into plane. Here the screw heads are sequentially pulled up to the rod and the caps placed and the screw cap um, screwed on. These are left loose to allow sequential lengthening of the spinal column. Intermittently, the transcranial motor evoked potentials are being stimulated and read in the, in the limbs to see that the spinal cord function is still intact, as the, there is risk during the correction process that the, that, uh, the spinal cord can be injured. You can see the rod has been partially rotated into plane to facilitate the correction. Caps occasionally need to be tapped down with a little bit of force, such as here with the mallet. The top screw being applied, and then the apex will be pulled towards the rod. There's a variety of tools available. And this is a persuader that's pulling the rod into the screw. As you can see here, both in a translation and pulling the spun and screw head up towards the rod using a distractive process over here. In this case, uh, we use fixed heads. My preference is fixed heads, so you don't lose any of the correction via articulation but there's a variety of surgical sets that are available. The last screw cap going on for the concave side. Once they are all articulated, the spine can be corrected, further corrected. So leaving the screw heads loose, the rod will be manipulated into plane which will spontaneously translate the spine into a corrective position. The rod holes are applied to the rod, there's counterforce on the thoracic prominence, the rod is rotated, ro rotated around the global fashion but it is causing segmental derotation of the vertebrae as can be seen here. The rod Holders are repositioned to further rotate the rod until the surgeon is happy that it is rotated into plane and the concavity and apex of the curve is brought across into an aligned position. During this process there will be lengthening of the spinal column and again the patient's neurological integrity will need to be confirmed on the spinal cord monitoring. Distally the screw caps can be locked to stop the rod rotating back into plane I prefer to leave the, the rest loose if possible, so it allows correction when I place a second rod. Here I'm a, uh, performing a facetectomy at all levels, not only to release the column, but also encourage the um, fusion process subsequently. The inferior articular facet is removed with the cape nagauge and nibbler, and the cartilage on the posterior aspect of the super superior articular process is scratched off with a correct or the capener. This bone is collected and morselized in the bone mill <coughs> for later use. This rod is easier to estimate in terms of length because there's no further lengthening on the side. It is contoured to accommodate the normal sagittal balance and placed in the wound where the screws are sequentially attached to the rod like before. important to be 
care of the skin, always pulling the skin out of the way and not repeatedly damaging skin and muscle when, when placing the screwdrivers and rods, the screw screwdrivers and caps. One must be cautious not to apply too much force to the chest, remembering when you're pushing down, you can compress the heart and frequently one reduces the preload with drops in blood pressure doing this. This rod is often underbent to apply a pressure on the um, thoracic prominence, forcing down the rib hump, derotating the apex and correcting the rotational aspects of the deformity. As you can see, while this is sequentially done, there's increasing correction of the deformity as the rotation is improved. The rod is now forced down into the distal screws, compressing the prominence down. The tool is, is, pushing, is relatively bringing the screw up to the rod and pushing the prominence down. Again, the screws are tightened and slightly released so that there is uh, flexibility between the screw and rod as there will be some fine tuning of correction a little bit later. Again, making sure you're not catching the skin each time. The final caps are placed. Again, the rod is Make sure that in the correct sagittal and coronal alignment to give you coronal correction. Remembering where the patient is in space to make sure that your planes are all correct. Check that the rod lengths are adequate. You can see I'm doing further correction here by distracting on the concavity's apex to further correct the curve. At this point, I'll be checking the transcranial motivated potentials quite frequently, probably between every action, to see if there's been a significant change. Here, yeah, there's a subsequent just a correction of this uh, the concave deformity, and this is where the art is in scoliosis surgery. The shoulders need to be balanced, which is often a problem, uh, depending on the type of curve, and one must be careful not to push the, curve, the shoulder up too much depending on the on the case final tightening is then done one may choose to do inside you further inside you bending the rods if occasionally the curve is quite st stiff the rods bend and one has coronal benders to straighten the rods again but in this case it was a relatively flexible curve However, I was a little concerned about the top right screw being a little high for the shoulder and decided to just compress it down a little bit. This was a uh, double thoracic curve and the, um, there was a small contralateral curve at the top here that just needed a little bit uh, of correction. Just bringing that T4 screw down and subsequently bringing the T2 screw down with the compressor. Often the width of the compressors are not enough to get between the screws and you need to put a, a rod holder there just to, to apply a counter pressure. Intermittently I'll be washing out the wound uh, to try and minimize the bacterial contamination which we know occurs. Uh, we're using a cell saver, sucking up the blood and spinning it down. It's very seldom that you need to transfuse the patient. There we go, you've got a pretty good straight spine. Another irrigation, getting the clot out. There can be surprisingly little lot blood loss in these thoracic scoliosis using tramosamic acid. Um, make sure the patient's not too cold, especially at the beginning of the operation. Don't let them cool down, keep them covered, use of a uh, warming blanket throughout the procedure.
Then there'll be decortication, where I'll remove the spines from the patient. We'll morselize the spines in the bone mill. I tend to use a bone nibbler for this. I'll then take a cape and a gouge and just lift up the lamina, um, just decorticate, but leave it, just bend it up, leave um, it attached so it's not totally devascularized, just up and down the spine, creating a bleeding bed of bone to encourage fusion. The morselized bone will then be placed up and down the spine. Some days you have more than other days. I like to use a cappuccino spoon, which makes it much easier. I usually augment this with allograft dust, which not only enhances the fusion but also provides a hemostasis with the fine dust clotting quite quickly with the blood. Here we go, the allograft demineralized bone matrix, and the operation is complete. Here's just a few slides to remind you, screws going in, other screws going in, rod applied, corrected, bone dust, and close. I don't use a drain, otherwise the patient bleeds too much, simple closures. And here we can get uh, the result.